Um, so again, really excited to have you all here, excited for the panelists that we've got. Um, we happen to have a bunch of panelists that are people I deeply, deeply respect. And, uh, and so we're really excited to hear from all of them. We're, we're gonna get to talk about the state of the movement. And uh, so that, that means a couple of things. As you see, we have folks coming in from many different places. Uh, and so because of that, folks from Colombia, uh, Canada, US, uh, we're, we're also a number of folks from Asia are coming in, uh, people from Brazil. Uh, and just because of the range of where people are coming from, of course, we can't speak to your specific context uh, in the sense of here's here's exactly what Daniel, I live right outside of Philadelphia. Here's what Daniel should be doing in his part of the, the world. But instead, a chance to look at some of the big themes, some of the things that are happening uh, on sort of both global trajectories um, and also a chance to hear from some of our movement leaders and elders and respected people about how they're how they're making meaning of this moment. And so obviously we're not gonna cover everything. This is a step back. It's a chance to step out of our immediate moment and to cover some things that maybe is ground we don't always cover or to hear some affirmation. So in the first half, uh, we'll have um, uh, uh, Yeb is gonna talk with Bill McKibben and with uh, Svetlana. Um, and so they'll be talking about some of the big themes. And then in the second half, we'll get to hear um, from a couple of organizers. We'll get to hear from Shimona um, in Seattle. And we're going to get to hear from uh, Oscar Sampaio in Colombia, who's been working on fracking, um, about how, how are they navigating this moment? Because between the pandemic, between shifts in people's understanding of climate change, between the changing political landscape, things are moving. And how are organizers adjusting? How are we dancing with history in this moment? And so both some, some concrete tips might emerge as well as some broad things. So what we're hoping for is uh, something that will speak to your condition to give some insight to whatever your reality is uh, and to prepare you uh, for, for what, your, uh, what your situation might be and what might be next for you. So just as a way of kind of introducing our panel today, I've been, I've had this imagination of thinking of it as us just kind of sitting by the river, having a conversation. I live right next to the Delaware River, which is uh, between New Jersey and Pennsylvania in the US. And uh, here where I live, uh, it's a spot where the Lenny Lenape, the native community before the colonizers came, they used to come and it was a place for ritual and gathering, uh, both a hunting ground, but also a ground for uh, crafting ritual together. And so I think of this evening or whatever time zone it happens to be for you, I think of this as a chance for us to have some conversation uh, just like we might on a river. And I think about rivers, especially because I, I really live in the, the trajectory of thinking of movements as rivers that uh, movements are very much like rivers in that even though we call it the Delaware River, it's not any one thing. And so the movement is many things to many different people. There's little eddies over here and there's uh, the mainstream and the central part of it. There's parts that go backwards or parts that go forwards. And so we step into the movement, we may step out of it at one point, but no part is the same. Uh, so even though we call it one thing, it means many, many different things to different people. And so what we're going to get to hear from is some different people's parts of the river uh, and what meaning they're making of it. So uh, let's sit down and chat. And I wanted to, we're, we'll get to chat, as I said, in the first part with um, uh, three different people. I won't do long introductions, but I'll I'll say just a few things about the people. So um, Svetlana is someone who I've known for a while in 350 uh, as a colleague and as a friend. And she has been, I think, very much at the forefront of articulating what Putin's war means to the rest of us uh, and what the conditions are in terms of its relationship to climate change, because this is a fossil funded war. And uh, so she brings both passion and as a Ukrainian, deep, 
deep empathy for what's happening right now. Um, Yev is someone who is newer to me uh, in terms of getting to know him personally, but uh, he's had many, I think of him, I don't know if this is fair yet, but I think of him as someone who's had many life changes, iterations as an internal policy person who's been working in sort of halls of government and internal climate negotiations. And then also as an extremely passionate activist and carried out one of the most moving talks if you ever get to see him announcing his hunger strike. Um, it's just an incredibly passionate uh, example of how people on the front lines can bring such passion, clarity, scientific knowledge, and accumulated wisdom and elder experience into one just powerful uh, event. And so he's been very much on the front lines for many of us and a reference point for quite a number of us about how we orient. And then Bill McKibben uh, is joining us and thank you, Bill. Bill stepping in uh, for, um, we had a, a sort of some last minute issues. And so Bill stepping in last minute, thank you for doing that, Bill. Um, and many of you may know Bill uh, as someone who he often talks about himself as having written the first book on climate change, which I think marks him as someone who has been a prophet on this issue for quite some time and someone who has had a, a consistent bead about what's going on in different parts of the movement and has tracked it very carefully. So I won't do more introductions than that, um, but I want to kick it out. I want to start with Yeb, actually. Um, uh, for you, Yeb, just to share with us uh, a little about what you're seeing in terms of where is the movement right now? And uh, and so just to bring us in, what are some of the dynamics that you're seeing? There's, there's many different places to start. So just start us one place uh, and then we'll, we'll bring in Bill and Svetlana along the way. So thank you for coming and jump on in. Thank you very much, Daniel, and pleasant day uh, to all friends and colleagues and comrades all over the world uh, for this opportunity to have this conversation. I, I start by saying I'm very mindful that my perspective is based on my lived experiences, of course, always limited more than um, we would want and enhanced by my conversations, by my pedagogy on the issues and by my own awakening as we confront I would, I would always consider the most pervasive crisis that we face, the climate crisis. The movement, um, as we unpack it in this conversation, is a complex movement. And we can look at it from different lenses, from different angles. We can see it from an issue-specific angle uh, or sector-specific. Um, and then there are those synergies. We can also look at it from, from a geographic standpoint where we look at the map of the world and see all of these communities of resistance standing up uh, for what is right, standing up against uh, apathy, uh, avarice, and 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 arrogance of uh, of the fossil fuel industry and those who wreck the planet. There's been a lot of um, different levels of of progression in terms of issue specific battlegrounds or fights that we are waging. Um, and even sometimes uh, just to call these battlegrounds is a bit tricky, right? Uh, because um, when, when we look at battlegrounds, that connotes um, uh, a, a war, right? And then we also have this notion that are we really winning the war or are we just really winning little battles? I'm, I'm really inspired to see the growth of the climate justice movement, of course, which I would, uh, for, for lack of a, maybe at the risk of being oversimplistic, call it a subset of the bigger environment movement or even a subset of the climate movement, but the climate justice movement, um, which is, uh, you know, uh, creating a groundswell of, uh, of inspiration, of, of inspiring creative legal action, especially in many parts of the world, has brought us a different texture to the movement. And we've seen, you know, when, when you see cases being filed and cases being won against the industry, that is inspiring. That creates a mindset for many of us that, uh, that hope is always possible, that despite the overwhelming crisis that we have in our hands, despite the powerful uh, 
interest involved in this whole thing and you know the, the resources that we have always spill in comparison um, to the industry it is all, always uplifting to see that uh, you know whether it's the farmer from Peru or it's uh, youth uh, in the Netherlands uh, but also many different communities uh, at the front lines of the climate crisis um, be, you know um, being able to understand the power that is in their hands and take that power uh, into the halls of uh, of the law then that that creates really uh, a a different energy i think for for the movement and then you have uh, other issue specific things uh, uh, you know communities of resistance against specific projects whether it's uh, oil pipelines or uh, coal mines, coal-fired power plants in many different parts of the world. I, I, I happen to um, work uh, a lot in, in a region that we consider as the last bastion of, of coal when many coal-fired power plants are being retired in many parts of the world. You know, Southeast Asia, we're building hundreds of them. And and that is a challenge, but that, that, is, that is also an opportunity for us. There's also, uh, aside from coal, of course, or resistance in general to fossil fuels, oil, gas, um, uh, and, and, and the gas resistance has become uh, much, uh, much, uh, much, much bolder now and a lot more collaboration happening around the world. We're also looking at projects, uh, you know, campaigns against uh, fossil fuel infrastructure, um, and and finance work has been something we we have uh, we have seen being elevated to, to to levels we've never imagined before. Uh, a lot of success, for example, in uh, in pushing for divestment, but also a lot of success in making financial institutions, banks, whether private banks or even uh, public institutions. Um, stop funding fossil fuels uh, uh, fossil fuel projects and in particular uh, in, in the developing in developing world that is big that is that is something that we can take inspiration from and 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 for me one of the uh, uh, because because i work in the uh, climate litigation field um it it's it it uh, it, give, it it uh, gives me uh, a lot of a lot of happiness to see how may, we are able to make major polluters or what we call uh, carbon majors pay for the cost of this crisis. And while we are, of course, winning some of these battles in the uh, chambers of law, but also uh, winning some battles in the, I, I would think, chambers of, 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 uh, of parliament and, and legislation, I think we're also winning this in the chambers of people's hearts, uh, and, uh, and and that is something that we, we want to be uh, proud of and, and build on. And then there's the sector specific things that we see around the world uh, where uh, we, of course, see indigenous people's communities um, connecting with many other communities around the world. and you know uh, claiming taking taking uh, staking that claim to to their uh, rights as indigenous peoples in many um in many territories in many 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 nations and 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 that has uh, that has really infused a the, a spirit of solidarity and a renewal for many of us and a, I would think a reboot, a correction of history is something that should always be at the core of what we do as climate activists uh, and, and, and acknowledging not because, because the, climate, the climate crisis is after all a, a manifestation of all of the mistakes, not just simple mistakes, but brutal mistakes in, in the history of humanity. I would even consider this as the, the biggest injustice in human history, where those who suffered the most from its impacts are those who contributed the least to the problem, but also this is deeply connected to how uh, the, the pre-colonial, uh, you know, political economy was that was 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 destroyed, was damaged by colonialism, and uh, it would it would only be possible for us to overcome. This crisis uh, through the colonial through through uh, a, a the colonial lens and and uh, I am I am 
inspired no end by the synergy that's happening with, uh, with with indigenous communities. We also see, of course, the women in gender sector, gender justice has, uh, uh, is also very central to the political dynamic that has brought us this crisis. And we see so much synergy there. We see su such a strong force um, uh, that, that, that is uh, enhancing the way the climate movement is doing its work in many places. And then uh, it goes without saying that in, mo in, the, in, in very recent years, the youth has done what we have been trying to do for many decades. It has uh, brought in so much power into, into this fight. And while the pandemic has dampened uh, the work that we all do across the world, you know, the youth uh, has not stopped uh, doing what it has started to do. And, and it's phenomenal. This, the rise of the youth has been phenomenal. And I want to pay tribute and homage to that. I think uh, uh, I'm sure I'm sure Svetlana and Bill will talk uh, more about uh, all of this inspiring phenomenon in the climate movement uh, as we go along. And then I also wanna uh, wanna make sure I mention forest communities because when we talk about the climate crisis, we talk about people who live in uh, places who and, and depend on a healthy environment and who are standing up against the um, the the destruction of nature. And I work, uh, of course, in a region where we have the last standing ancient forest and. And to see communities there rise up and stand up and and make sure that uh, uh, that uh, biodiversity is uh, is protected, that their uh, own legacy, their own um, patrimony is is protected, it, it's it's really inspiring. And then trade unions uh, is also a very important uh, sector I want to mention because uh, uh, it, it's a complicated sector, but uh, we've seen how trade unions have. Um, have, have joined forces with the climate movement, uh, not just in, in terms of uh, creative legal action, but also in, in uh, communities of resistance, in, in broadening the conversation uh, and, and making sure that uh, the just transition element uh, is, uh, is uh, something that is being emphasized strongly. And then, and then uh, the last, I, I think the last lens I would, I would want to offer is the geographic lens. Um, what I could say in general is that uh, we have spread the, the fight to so many important battlegrounds. And when, when I say battlegrounds that need to be fought for the sake of our planet, uh, we see so much um, uh, energy you know, happening in the global south, and, and, and that matters a lot. That matters a lot, not just because I, I come from the global south, but, uh, but that is uh, the way, the, the only way this, um, this crisis will be overcome is uh, if, there, if we build solidarity like we've never done before. And, um, and, and we, we develop and create leadership uh, in all parts of the world, especially those uh, who are suffering from in the, at the front lines of this crisis. So should we be optimistic? I think there, there is no choice for us, but to always fill our hearts with hope, not the regular kind of, of tokenism uh, kind of hope, but radical hope, radical hope. Uh, because I think Bill has said this before, the good news is that we'll at least be able to say that we tried that uh, with conviction we stood up and we fought the good fight. Sometimes we feel, um, I, th I think we can call it, we feel tribal, a bit parochial, and we feel the weight of the failure uh, of the movement. It happens, right? It happens. Uh, it is a cycle. And then, you know, coming from a country where we ousted a dictator um, 40 years ago, now we are faced with uh, the son of that dictator becoming the head of our country and that puts a lot of weight uh, on you and sometimes you think are we really really uh making progress in this fight well it is it is a journey it is a journey and that that challenge remains and we're uh we live in a rapidly changing world where when i started as, a, as an activist uh, we didn't even have cell phones we didn't have email now the activists of today have all of those tools have that uh, unprecedented kind of connectivity and connection and and we do have 
new challenges to face, including, of course, the pandemic, including, of course, the kind of disinformation and, and that's happening all, all around us and the political tidal waves that we face. I would think of this as we should avoid thinking of the movement as a linear progression. I think we should always look at it as a journey, as an iterative cycle, um, and and for us to come back and I think not not necessarily um, uh, reincarnate because we never we should never you know die. But uh, it's an it's an algorithmic progression, and the and the stronger we make ourselves today the stronger it can only be tomorrow. And we are only as strong as our collective uh, strength. And so um, we, we don't want to look at it from a, from a linear standpoint. There are so many stories from dif different parts of the world, stories of tragedy, but also stories of heroism, uh, whether it's people standing up against specific, um, uh, specific uh, for example, fossil, fossil fuel projects or uh or you know expressing solidarity with each other when people suffer from uh, climate impacts whether it's uh, severe droughts and and forest fires or or flooding as we see in Pakistan right now uh the kind of solidarity we are expressing to our to our friends in Pakistan has never been seen before. And, and for me, that, that is something we must celebrate uh, despite the tragedies, because there is a lot of solidarity happening and we can always translate that into a political force, uh, which is needed, which is really needed for us to push the envelope on, um, on what needs to be done by policymakers and decision makers. We're, I'm, I, I think I'm gonna just, uh, uh, mention a couple more things and that is we our job is to continue organizing and organizing does not mean uh we 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 rely on on old on old methods we have to innovate but also we we have to understand that organizing has no magic wand it has no silver bullet you'll have to go out there talk to one or two people convince them one day at a time um, but we should never stop doing it. And I see so many organizations, people's organizations, communities doing that, never getting tired of doing that, whether it's in Latin America, in Africa, in the Pacific, in Europe, um, in, in Asia, and in Africa. It's uh, in, 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 in the Americas, we see so many people uh, just striving to do that. And the reasons, I think, that make us lose sleep at night, all of this problems we think about, I think those same reasons should push us out of bed in the morning. Um, so sometimes really the acts of resistance should just make your morning a little brighter. So where do we go from here? I think there's a lot of different pathways for many of us, but uh, ultimately we must build solidarity like we have never ever done before because uh, we need that solidarity. That is difficult. That is easier said than done. But for the people's movement to stand steadfast, uh, build that solidarity and connect the people's movement in the global north and in the global south and, and continue the, 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 the power dynamics that have given us this crisis. Um, I, I would think that um, it, it's really important as a last point I want to make really important to um, understand as well uh, that intersectionality is a key piece in all of this. Uh, it, it is uh, important that the, the climate crisis is never discussed in isolation of social justice, of racial justice, of, of gender justice. And with that, I think the movement has, has become stronger because of that. And we have to continue doing that to see the movement become much, much stronger. There's so many details to this, uh, so many wonderful stories that I'm sure that Shimona will also share later. Um, and it's not just uh, the number of followers that our rock stars in the climate movement has on social media that should be the defining a factor for the strength of the movement, but I think, but that is also a, a source of inspiration for us seeing so many 
um, leaders in the climate movement start uh, to resonate with uh, with billions of people. That that uh, that is something uh, that that is so inspiring. So I would I would think uh with with me again as a caveat being an eternal optimist i see that the climate movement since i began this uh this work uh, many decades ago has become much much stronger and the boardrooms of fossil fuel companies are trembling in, in, uh, in are trembling because of this movement thank you daniel thank you so much thank you for bringing us a, a trajectory of the movement a kind of a, a course of following what are some of the well you started by saying the battlefield is the wrong metaphor but but we're always wondering i think in the movement what is our yardstick of progress are we are we doing better or worse and of course one yardstick is whether or not co2 emissions the ultimate yardstick is whether co2 emissions are plunging that's the ultimate yardstick on on, on this issue related to climate specific but that also there's there's these important measurements for movement because our movement doesn't win it sort of a constant we win we win we win we win as you say there's a back and forth and so we take steps forward and we take steps back and so there's aspects of strength that are happening of stronger communities stronger resistance uh and also identification that our opponents are more fearful of us than they have been in the past and uh, that shows in some of the greenwashing tactics. They're now, they're now trying to appease, which is different from where they were 30 years ago, where they were just outright doing whatever they wanted without even, without even the courtesy of lying to us and to the public. So here we are in shifting times. Uh, Bill, I wanna add, add more texture to some of these comments about what are some of the things that you're seeing uh, where you sit? And, and where you're seeing some of the different elements that, that are relevant for where we are in the movement right now. Well, first of all, what a pleasure to get to listen to Yeb as always, and just to get to say hi and, and uh, across Zoom and say thank you for enormous work. And what fun to be with Svetlana too. Um, we've gotten to do some work these last six months, sadly, because, um, you know, because the fossil fuel industry is literally bombing her, her country, you know, so, we're, we're, we're I, I, there are moments and the Marcos election was one of them where you just think you're running in place in this world and there's moments like the invasion of Ukraine when it just feels like we're back in the middle of the 20th century you know um, but but I'm going to make the argument just briefly here that we are doing a hell of a job as a movement and we're beginning to see important things happen um, I think that we're at a couple of hinge points in human history one of them terrible and one of them powerful um, clearly one of them is we have now destabilized the planet's climate system in horrible ways and we see the evidence of it every moment of every day now right now we're thinking very hard of our brothers and sisters in pakistan uh, the indus river is 100 kilometers wide now at its widest point because there is more rain than there's ever been that fell up in the Khyber Pass. Um, just un unbelievable rain of the kind you can only have in an overheated world. At the same time, the Yangtze is running dry in China, and hundreds of millions of people have spent this summer in the grips of the most fearsome heat wave probably that the, the humanity has ever seen. Um, and, and all of that is bad and will continue to be bad and in fact will get worse in the years ahead because it's clear that there's momentum in this breakdown of physical systems so that's the bad news that we all know about and one of the things that motivates us constantly to work on the other hand we're at a fascinating moment because movements have done their work and because scientists and engineers have done their work we are at very close to a moment when we can cease the 200,000 year human career of setting stuff on fire. You know, it served us well back in long ago when we were able to start cooking food and when we were able to move north and south away from the equator because we had fire and even the anthropologists tell us when we learned sitting around the campfire at night, many of the social bonds that mark our species and, of course, 
combustion, burning stuff, coal, gas, and oil brought us modernity in the last 300 years for good or for ill. Um, but now we don't need it anymore. We live at a point in time when all of a sudden the cheapest way to generate energy on this planet is to point a sheet of glass at the sun. That is magic, you know? That's water into wine. That's some um, um, just, uh, and it, it allows us to imagine now going very, very quickly in the right direction. So the metaphor that works here is a race. To try and put in place the technologies and the ways of living that will allow us to slow down that climate crisis. And not just the climate crisis, because this last couple of years have been full of reminders that there are other important reasons to get off fossil fuel. We know now from the medical community, who finally produced really good data on this last year, that 9 million humans a year die from breathing the combustion byproducts of fossil fuel. That's one death in five on this planet and unnecessary because we know what the vaccine for breathing those combustion byproducts is. It's called electric bikes and air source heat pumps. None of these are perfect. There's no thing that doesn't cause trouble in this world and we have to figure out how to mine cobalt and lithium and things in ways that don't destroy the planet. But that's 9 million people a year, one human death in five, more than malaria, AIDS, tuberculosis, uh, 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 COVID combined uh, uh, each year, and completely unnecessary. And we're reminded again by what's happened in Ukraine of the tight link between fossil fuel and fascism. Um, um, we should know it all the time. I mean, in our country, the Koch brothers, our biggest oil and gas barons, used their winnings from their, their oil and gas to buy themselves a political party and degrade our democracy. The king of Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, gets a, a, a pass even as he cuts people's heads off with the sword because we need his oil. Um, Vladimir Putin invades Ukraine because he has unlimited amount of money that comes from oil and gas, 60% of his export earnings. So the ability to quickly get off fossil fuel is the most important thing that we could be possibly doing right now. It is an epic human task, and it's possible not just because of the work of scientists and engineers, but even more because of the work of movements over time. Um, 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 the last 15 years, as we've built movements around this planet, it's been incredibly beautiful to watch human beings rising up in defense of science and against the biggest, richest, most powerful industries on the planet. And that work has been so amazing to watch. Let me just finish by saying, Yeb was absolutely right that youth are playing a huge role here, a big leadership role, and we should be incredibly grateful for it. When I started 350, it was with seven college students, you know, and then the kids who took up the divestment campaign were the same people who, when they graduated college, formed the Sunrise Movement and brought us the Green New Deal. And that's why we finally got a bill through Congress earlier this uh, uh, summer, the first time the U.S. Congress has ever acted on climate change. But, but it's not okay to just, I've heard too many people say, oh, it's up to the next generation to solve this problem. That's not okay. Um, we've got to back them up with everything we've got. And I'll just end by saying, we're having a lot of fun now at this thing we're calling Third Act. Uh, nobody else on this call is old enough to join, I don't think. But uh, uh, for those of us over 60, we're organizing hard uh, to back up young people in this fight. One of the things we're really taking on hard is uh, uh, the banks that finance the fossil fuel system. And we were just out at a big bank protest uh, that we helped to organize. And of course, lots of high school kids came because high school kids are, you know, know what it's about. And they're somewhat younger and spryer, so they were at the head of the march. But at the back of the march, there was a big crowd of us, you know, people with hairlines that looked like mine. And we were marching under a big banner that said, fossils against fossil fuels. 
Uh, so, you know, that's the spirit we're going to do this in. We're going to back people up. We're going to make it clear uh, 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 just how fast we have to change. I cannot tell you how this race is going to come out, but Yeb's right. We are right in the middle of this race. And I, I'm going to stop talking now because I want to hear from Svetlana because she's in the this year in the white hot heart of all of this. I'll just say that for me, the greatest pleasure of the year, the, the, the sweetest small victory of the year was the work that we did at Third Act to try and pass Coke successfully. This bill we were calling heat pumps for peace and freedom to get a, 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 a renewable technology off to Europe because they're facing a to turn off the gas. And if we can turn on renewable energy there, we'll do a lot for freedom and a lot to keep this planet from going any further into the depths of destruction than it already has. So, so many thanks to everybody who does this. Um, it's really amazing to have gotten to watch it come from nothing 30 years ago to where we are now. And what a privilege to get to be a small part of it. Thank you, Bill. Um, and some people are, have some comments about, uh, can they get, join Third Act if they're not a US resident? So feel free to add that in the chat if you can, uh, and other ways that they can participate. And I wanna turn it to Svetlana. I do love that people are using the chat effectively to also ask questions and coordinate. So I, I think that's beautiful. Um, Jaden's helping offer some suggestions. Uh, Svetlana, so, um, as Bill said, you've been, you know, right in the middle of things here. So bring us into both how you're reading this moment um, and tell us a little about the context where we're, what you've been up to and what you're working with right now. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. And that's always an immense pleasure to speak on the one uh, event or webinar or whatever gathering with Bill and with Yep as well as with you and with you, Daniel and with many, many others who are the power of the movement and who are the movement in general. Because I'll probably start from my personal example, when I personally witness all power our climate movement holds towards the social change that we can make all together. At the very beginning of the war uh, in my country, it was uh, February 40, 40, uh, 24th, and we just woke up all from explosions in different cities and it was massive and before that we've been uh, listening to the insane speech of some the same seemingly insane dictator who made uh, decades of of absolute absolute brutality and uh, um, uh, illegal power on fossil fuel revenues and we see those dictators also by the way popping up in many countries and strengthening try to strengthening their power through the through owning the fossil fuel reserves but i think now it's a time when we can stop all of them as we started doing since the war in my country started because the first thing i was thinking of uh, as a campaigner, as a part of the movement, how can I make appropriate change for my country happen at this very moment? Is our power of organizing is strong enough? Are our connections and trust that we've built over the years uh, is strong enough to bring the change in immediately? And I just call on uh, some uh, people, uh, activists, movements in different countries and saying so. Uh, I've been a part of a, a movement that has been led by 350, by, by Loud Out of Sea movement, by face groups. And I worked a lot with the people in the global south. And it was so much impressive to me when people from the regions which are and have been historically the most effective as a uh, most affected as an African continent uh, by colonialism by discrimination of any kind as a Latin American countries as Asian countries suffering from their own own sufferings because people suffer seemingly everywhere and from the same reason which are fossil fuels and the climate crisis and energy crisis and many other crises that war just propped up and um, exacerbated in many ways and it was absolutely amazing for me to see and to receive the message of solidarity and see a concrete action from many many organizations and we had a coalition of 
860 organizations from over 60 countries, which was, was called Stand with Ukraine, effectively acting to end fossil fuel war uh, of Russia against Ukraine, but also to end absolutely all fossil fuel fossil fuel conflict in many parts of the world because they are many and dictators are many and uh, but just Russia's brutally aggressive war in my country has made the point more cle clear than ever that fossil fuels are often used to prop up some of the world's most brutal regimes and even at expense of innocent people in democratic countries and maybe the fight for Ukraine's freedom as we see it happening for now with incredible resistance and I personally being at the front line I never could have said that it will last for six months so friends from the movement uh, keep telling me that yes this is the thing where the largest fossil fuel dictatorship is attacking you with the all powers they were collecting and colliding for many years so you have to be prepared to a long fight but these points come together to send us a strong message. Now is time more than ever to organize together and to take power to create climate justice everywhere. Because in addition to the war and conflicts uh, created by fossil fuels to immense and mounting um, energy crisis, because we don't know how we will live through this winter and winter will be especially uh, was unsafe and unkind to all of us for one part of the world because of a cost of living crisis. And for our part of, of, of the world where we are, just for, for the sake of survival and uh, safety for everyone who still remains alive uh, in Ukraine. And because half of our country is being absolutely destructed. And what we see our movement in a more broader sense, being united as it has been, as it still continues being acting towards the dictatorship uh, uh, empowered by fossil fuel revenues, towards the fossil fuel companies, as for example, I have a very good example of um, action against uh, Total Energies, which we had all together movements from Uganda and Tanzania and uh, many others from France, from, from all, all over the Europe and also uh, from Ukraine. We had a mock trial on Total and people traveled many, many, many long hours and ways just to say that fossil fuel companies have to stop their illegal activities and literally um, bombard the territory of our country killing civilians as total energy does still for the moment uh, just absolutely hypocrisy refusing all uh, and rejecting all accus all very fair accusations but i believe that this time will come soon that we will celebrate one win after another win as a movement because uh we are the power to change and uh, actually the power of organizing um i mean with the new tools available to use via the internet and social media we are able to quickly mobilize across the world which we, we've seen it uh during um multiple actions we had and especially those that led by uh fridays for future and other youth movements because all 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 um sp spring and all summer we had continuing actions of and mobilizations in europe and across the world to ban all russian fossil fuels and we had some successes as well which where i can list the embargo on coal and in, uh, partial embargo on oil and now we are strongly trying to push for a gas embargo from the european union and what we see on the other side happen, happening that um, the european union but also all the world all uh, countries that have been um put into the dependency from fossil fuel uh, revenues and undemocratic regimes as from russia being mostly based with the economic success on Russian cheap gas and available oil. Then I start, started thinking, what, what, what should we do and how can we escalate this clean energy transition, how we can build more renewables, even if we do have money to invest in them? Well, we have, do we have enough of willpower or we just better look behind on us and just close, open the doors to, to, to another continent to look for LNG terminals and to look for some LNG gas and for continuing investment in, into the dead and into the fossil fuels. And to say so, I see a 
climate movement as a big and a powerful unity of people everywhere in every part of the world right, collectively rising up against the fossil fuel dictatorships. And I truly believe this day, these days that we win will come because we are now putting pressure on governments, uh, including banks and financial institutions everywhere. And from the latest, we have the Citibank, one of the biggest financial of Russian fossil fuels, but also other fossil fuels, announcing that they are bringing up some credits and uh, um, loans in commercial loans in Russia. And uh, we won't stop there. We would like to uh, strengthen the global movement to end the fossil fuel era, especially uh, as people learn how dirty energy has enabled the war against our country and other devastating conflicts around the world and um, as they see impact on the Ukrainian people and our struggle I have also to say is a struggle for justice and I can't agree more with yet stating today that any kind of justice is extremely important and we even can't divide them into racial social climate justice because this is the one we have to achieve the justice towards everyone on the planet and i believe this time will 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 we we will witness soon and we will uh, fasten fasten this fight uh, with the uh, uh, inspiring um energy transformation and um, what i also wanted to say uh because people sometimes uh when they don't see a quick wins can get discouraged that Yes, things are not happening overnight. We we would like to cut all financial flows to Putin or to other dictator in the world overnight to make them close all tabs, to make them to make them abandon all activities. But to do so, to achieve the, this, we have to understand that they were building their illegal power for many years, and we now have such a short time to win over them. So that's why we have to be as much powerful as never. And um, uh, to end with that, to end with uh, this, I um, would like to say thank you and how grateful we are for international solidarity, for global solidarity, being felt the most from different parts of the world and from different movements. And I can name uh, 350, of course, because that's become a family and Sunrise Project become a family, Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, many big and small organizations and uh, Afiego from, from um, uh, Uganda and Tanzania, Partners Against ECOP, and many, many others who made their role and who said a good word, who sent a good attitude towards us and who participated campaigns. And the most effective thing I've been witnessing is that we've not, we've not been coordinating that much, having uh, extensive goals, but the movement is the movement and the movement is um, independent and sufficient and the distributed campaigning was happening and is still happening in the many effective ways where everyone is bringing and building a change separately but when we come together we see the picture and this beautiful picture inspires me to move forward and I feel um, that I am only a very small dot on the world map of a beautiful many many beautiful dots in every part of the world forever connected and super connected and very efficient and very well organized. And I wish us all always believe in to win that we are those, this generation that can deliver the wins. So we don't have other way. And I believe just the very final moment um, that since the very beginning, I truly believe that um, climate crisis and the war an energy crisis have share the same roots and these roots are fossil fuels. And I think no doubt for now that we have to uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely uh, defund, uh, de-bleed and absolutely uh, end the root cause of all these problems, the fossil fuels. And that's then we all will live in peace with the renewable energy community owned and uh, fossil fuel companies will be our blame in history. Thank you so much. Thank you so, <clears throat> thank you so much, Svetlana.
um, I'm always moved by by the work you're doing and and the way you're carrying yourself in this time. And as you're talking about this fabric uh, of the global community, um, I'm looking at in the back of Bill's video, he has a picture of Martin Luther King who said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I think the reverse is also true, which is part of what you're saying, that justice anywhere is also a threat to injustice everywhere. And that's part of what we're building here is our little pieces of justice that we're creating, those moments, uh, those have echoes outwards. And so it's interesting, each, each one of you brought a different component of hope uh, in the midst of a war, in the midst of uh, a very uh, huge setback politically in terms of the Marcos regime, um, in the context of uh, still the shadow of a Trump era. And I'm, I'm curious, uh, it, it's interesting that we're talking about hope in this way, uh, because I think many people, that's not the feeling that they would first express about the movement. That's not true for many of us, uh, that we're feeling in a different shape. And I'm curious, uh, what do you say uh, to folks or what's your position with those of us who are not feeling that particular feeling? Uh, in terms of the the psychology of where we are. So I'm just curious, like, how are you navigating with the folks that you're meeting who are not feeling in that shape uh, at this moment, either because they're reading it differently or because just our, our own personal psychology? So I just want to open for a few minutes that, and, and there may be some other questions that will also drift in as well. But Yeb, Bill, since you both haven't chatted yet recently, what do you say to that? Yeah, um, that, that is truly important, um, Daniel. And it is sometimes numbing to experience so much um, of, and witness so much of the suffering around us. And uh, as Bill pointed out, we're nowhere near where we should be in terms of, uh, of averting the climate crisis. We have not averted, the Paris Agreement has not averted the climate crisis, uh, nor has this movement. Uh, and And therefore, it can be really challenging, but uh, it's also quite numbing because, you know, as activists, you need to try to be strong all the time or at least pretend to be, especially if you hold a leadership position. Um, but it is also life changing, you know, when all of these catastrophes give you very few choices, but it offers you the choice between hope and despair. Well, you, have, you will have to decide that uh, you, you, you choose something that will make you uh move forward and uh to your question i, I absolutely agree and uh, i think uh, at, i think at the risk of uh of uh of uh, a trademark violation i'd say uh it's okay not to be okay <laughs> but uh it's uh it's, it's the human condition that precisely uh wants us to understand well, why all of this is happening and Again, the personal it should always be political in, in the kind of work we do, and we should acknowledge the pain um, that we all go through. And what I would say uh, to those who are going through something difficult uh, at, a, at a very personal level, um, you are not alone. There's thousands of, of uh, activists who feel the same. And you know, after, after the Philippine elections, we 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 it was very heavy the feeling was very heavy i'd imagine of course um in 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 the in the case of our U uh, friends from ukraine that that is uh, way way beyond what i can imagine uh, and 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 to be such in a situation um i mean there there i don't know what to say to people who who really uh, feel so so heavy about things but uh, except to say that you're not alone and that uh, we, we want to be able to create mechanisms so that people can cope and anxiety for so many people, uh, you know, uh, in because of the climate crisis, especially for young people uh, is, uh, is uh, record breaking levels. So we, we want to be able to express support to each other as much as we can. Um, and also take inspiration from people who are able to pick up the pieces despite of tragedy. I know so many people uh, from lived experience, especially after Super Typhoon Haiyan, who lost their entire family, but now are 
inspiring beacons of activism uh, in the world. So it can be done. Uh, but again, not to impose on any particular individual on how they should feel, but uh, they should always be available available for, for each other. Uh, and and kindness is something that sometimes scars in 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 in, in many parts of uh, of this movement. And so I always advocate for kindness. Uh, kindness is something uh, that we should, should always remember and should be a badge of honor for us because uh, kindness is always lacking in, in the fossil fuel industry. So we have to behave like uh, uh, the total opposite of, of our enemies and, and, and that could give us a lot of strength. It's, it's hard, it's really hard. And there's no single answer to how people, how, how an individual should cope um, from, from all of this. Amen to that, amen to that. And just one of the things that's good about having a big movement is there are moments when it's just too hard for any of us to keep going for a while. And so we have to be able to step aside a little bit and let other people fill in for a little while. And that's part of what being in a movement is. You back up other people and fill in and, 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 and make sure, and you know, Six months from now, when Ukraine has won its fight, um, Svetlana is going to need to take, take some time off, you know, and and go catch up with actual life. And, and, and we're going to have to make sure that she can do that. And, you know, when people are uh, uh, in jail, we have to, you know, we, we have to come up with the money to bail them out and, you know, on and on and on. That's what movements do. They take care of each other. And it's, you know, there's always a temptation to have infighting and, you know, uh, uh, so on in movement. But I think that's the thing we should try our hardest to avoid. Unity really matters. And it's just such a, um, such a pleasure when we get to have gatherings like this and just be reminded of how many good people there are hard at work all the time in this fight. Thanks. And one more just area, and then we'll, we'll close this piece, um, is uh, when you're kind of scanning out there in the movement, what are some of the different pieces that uh, inspire you? Uh, and so Svetlana, of course, you're, you're in, in your moment, you're very much in your situation, but also for Bill and Yeb, both of you have a very international perspective. Um, and so what are some of the different uh, different movement pieces that you're finding, uh, well, let me say this a different, one, one other different way. People are often wondering, what should I do? And one thing they ask is, what's the one or two things that I should be working on right now? And so when you look at avenues that seem, these avenues have some mechanism to really take out the fossil fuel industry right now. What are some of the avenues that you think are most compelling for movement activists? If we're not researchers on solar bat, you know, solar technology, or we're not uh, policy analysts, what are the what are the avenues for movement activists that are most inspiring to you right now? So just give us give us one or two examples of those. Uh, so maybe Svetlana, if you want to share first, and then we'll uh, move on from others. Uh, yes, I would say to put a pressure, a visible pressure, a bold and fierce pressure on the policymakers, on the power holders, on financiers, on those who hold the keys, obviously, and uh, all funds to unlock that uh, renewable energy transformation. And just to give one example, speaking and lobbying are uh, to in the in the European Parliament inside against the EU taxonomy, which is absolutely, absolutely criminal as well. Uh, as long as war in Ukraine is uh, any connection to Russian gas is 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 and um, oil is very illegal. But I was confronted by a few MPs which were just eating their lunch and saying, "So." Um, and what plan can you offer to our voters uh, when I come to my country then? What can I say to them? How can they uh, continue, live as usual, do their business as usual, uh, use fossil fuels as usual, but if we won't have Russian oil and gas? And I said, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm not here for that. I'm here to represent a, polit a people's power and to make a pressure on you to find an expert, to find 
some budgets to find many things and resources that you are holding, being on the top, on the government, on the political power, and make these things possible. You have to create a plan, not we, not we. We just have to give you a strategic direction. And this is our avenue to provide some strategic directions and to put a pressure on those who think that they are on the top of the very tall mountain and exactly J7 in very isolated place, just being only accessible with a private uh, with the private helicopters, which normal people can't afford never. And uh, um, so no isolated spaces open politics and putting pressure on policymakers and being brave and being resilient and resistant. Wonderful. And I, I so appreciate the clarity, Svetlana, about this is what movements do. We put pressure. We don't have to come up with all the answers. And so some of the pressure that moves to local activists of suddenly we have to develop all of these plans, that's not, that's not our strength. Our strength is putting pressure. Uh, to be able to move move the mountain that way, Yeb, Bill, what are some of the pieces that you're you're seeing that are are avenues that you think are important for movement activists to be taking? What are some of the, the strategies that you see think have some merit for these times? Yeah, you want me to say a few things first? Well, well I'll say a couple of things, and then we'll end with you. Um, look, there's great stuff happening all over the world. You know, down in Australia, they've just launched this movement, Move Beyond Coal, to stop the export of coal out of the biggest world's biggest coal exporter. People in Africa are fighting hard against this uh, East African crude oil pipeline. They're doing amazing work, and I think they may well win. Uh, you know, on and on and on, all over the world. If you don't live next to a pipeline or a coal mine, you do live near a bank, you do live near some big pot of money that's contributing mightily to this problem. So uh, one of the things we're doing is trying to take on those banks, trying to take on really the capital and capitalism. Uh, the four biggest American banks, Chase, City, Wells, Fargo, Bank of America, are also the four biggest lenders to the fossil fuel industry, including being big lenders off to Vladimir Putin. So uh, we're organizing all this work to get people. We're going to have a big day in the spring when everybody uh, is cutting up their credit cards from these banks. And we're going to need people thinking of, we're going to need people underwater on dying coral reefs and people up against the, you know, uh, fire scarred forests and people outside banks and people in front of beautiful wind turbines and on and on and on. Um, because, because look, Wall Street remains incredibly important. And if we can bring these guys to their knees a little bit, then we can help out this race. Our job is to speed up the guys who are trying to do the right thing and trip up the guys who are trying to do the bad stuff. And so this is one way to go at it. Everybody's everybody's near some kind of money someplace and 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 let's take it out. So for me, ultimately, you know, we're all human beings. Uh, we are individuals after all, but uh, and therefore we want to look for opportunities that sustain each one of us and nurture our activism. And, you know, one of the most uplifting experiences I've had in, in recent months is whenever I go to a remote island or a remote community and just have conversations with them, how they're being affected not just by climate change, but uh, but um, but the uh, the kind of uh, uh, you know destructive economy that we we all live in, and whether these are fish fishing uh, communities or um, or farming communities, it's 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 really amazing to just uh, see their perspective, and and I would always recommend that to anyone uh, if if we're trying to. Uh, uh, enhance our activism or grow, uh, find growth in our activism. And there's always a challenge, of course, to find our praxis, the intersection of theory and practice. And I agree very much with, with Svetlana, uh, you know, we, in, in, in a movement, in, in this movement, we have too much paper, <laughs> we have too much, too many documents, we have too many plans. Uh, those things are important, but I think uh, uh, we we need uh, action. Always speaks louder than than all of these documents. So, uh, find uh, I find so much strength uh, when when we organize 
uh, civil disobedience actions especially so be you, you can be involved in a lot of civil creative means of civil disobedience uh wherever you are and um and that that really uh, allows you to uh, enhance the praxis uh, because that is one of the most fulfilling things for an organizer uh, to see your theory uh, come into reality and i also agree with uh, with uh, focus you know focus on on on, on things and not try to uh, to do so many things at the same time and uh, i think that's been the strength of uh, smaller organizations the focus uh, that they have and uh, it's really really amazing when uh, you, you start to home in on a particular issue and then you excel in that and uh, that really contributes uh, so much to the movement wonderful thank you everyone uh thank you yeb bill svetlana um this is really beautiful um so thank you for this phase. And th in the next uh, hour, we're gonna get to hear from uh, two campaigners to uh, kind of like a case study, that's kind of an academic term, but we get to just hear from some organizers uh, talking about how they're navigating some of the dynamics uh, within this phase, uh, within this the spirit of the movement. So um, uh, Shimona, I'm gonna ask you to, to if you'll go first, um, and then Oscar uh, Sampaio will get to share after that. Um, and so just as kind of a setup, Shimona. So Shimona and I have been chatting uh, for a while over the last couple of months, uh, largely over the question, well, I'll, I'll say it my way and, and then she can uh, navigate her own, but, but that for many of the groups I've worked with, at least, that I've both touched locally in my region and also tracking some of the different organizations in the globe, the pandemic has been an incredible hit to organizing. And so for many of us, it's been like hard restarts, total restart, old leaders who just got burned out or just needed to take care of themselves or their families or, or whatnot. And so that's been one, one piece of this state of the movement. And Shimon and I have been talking about how they've been navigating that. So I know there's lots of other considerations about how you're bringing in more climate justice perspective and intersectionality into your organizing. But uh, I was thinking Shimona would be great to tell some stories about how they're navigating this moment. And so those of you who are also organizers or activists, uh, maybe you might want to pull out your notepad and take some tips about, oh, that's a tactic we might try. So we'll get to hear from Oscar and, and Shimona. So Shimona, why don't you go first? Uh, and we'll go for uh, a period of time. And, and I may interrupt just to ask a few questions here and there. And then, um, uh, and then Oscar, we'll get to hear from you. Yeah. Go for you. it, Shimona. Thank you. Um... First, I just want to thank everyone for being here, and it's been such an honor to listen to you, uh, Yev and Svetlana and Bill. Um, really appreciative. Um, and I also just want to call in. Uh, I'm calling in from the Coast Salish lands, um, uh, the First Peoples of where I'm from, uh, otherwise known as uh, Seattle, Washington, USA. Um, and I also would like to name that I am. I'm nervous. Um, and so just like, please have patience with me. I'll try my best to speak slowly and clearly so people uh, can understand. Um, but uh, as a leader in my organization, I this is one of the things that I do um, to just like make space for everybody to like name their needs ahead of time um, to create a more uh, welcoming, accessible space as if we just come in with honesty of just like, here's where I'm at coming into this space. Um, and as a leader in my uh, group, it's been one of those things that I've built up um, in our organization, um, especially in response to the pandemic, um, when we all kind of had to collectively be like, whoa, here's what we all need to do right now, um, which is I can't be on Zoom calls. That's not how I participate and I need to step back. I need to be here for my family, so I need to step back. Um, this is a lot more emotionally uh, of a toll for me than I need to step back. And so the past few years, it's been a lesson in just like meeting people, really meeting people where they're at, 
and honestly, like we say that a lot, we throw that around a lot in a lot of movement spaces, but I think this was the past couple of years when we truly listened to people of what they needed um, and met them where they were at. Um, and so what that looks like, where I'm calling from at 350 Seattle, um, was really doing a deep dive in like what our community needed um, and how we could support them. And especially on a like community level, just person to person, but also in our campaign work. Um, and I'll speak a little bit about our campaign work first. We realized that we needed a lot more bring in a lot more resiliency because like there's systems in our Seattle that just like weren't working for us. And so we had to do the work in order to take care of our community. So we had a lot of like mutual aid pods popping up where we're like getting groceries to people who needed them, supplies, taking care of a lot of the houseless folks um, in our different neighborhoods in our um, community in Seattle. Um, and from that, we started to steadily learn and like change what we, what was a priority for us as an organization. And so at the beginning of the year, we went through the, you know, like a strategic plan where we uh, really got together and talked about what are the goals that we wanna achieve for the rest of this year after going through like the worst parts of the pandemic um, and climate crises um, and the Black Lives Matter movement. All of these things kind of took us to this point where we had to really evaluate what we have done in the past and how are we going to move forward um, and move forward in a way that really calls in the community resiliency. Um, and climate justice and kind of combining those to really deepen uh, our campaign work and what we call our climate resilience hubs. Um, so we went, we did what you said, Svetlana, like going after the people who are, do these policies, the, the key holders of different, those, so our city council and our state senators and legislators and representatives um, and putting pressure on them to meet the needs of the community right now because our community was suffering right now. Um, and so our work, we have focused our scope on solutions um, and community resilience um, hubs, um, specifically in like our community centers because that's where people gather. Um, and if we can't gather in those places in a safe, healthy way, then we need to do something about that. Um, so that on the campaign side is where we kind of like set our priorities and are doing a lot of uh, that great work. Um, and in that work is where we started uh, building deeper, more powerful, authentic relationships um, with uh, volunteers in our community, um, different partners in our community, specifically um, our partners that are uh, working on the front lines of the climate crisis and also on in the labor movement um, and other social justice um, organizations as well. And so through this camp these campaigns, we've built these beautiful coalitions where we have uh, organizations who are solely focused on like abolitionist um, principles. We have different types of unions um, and uh, specifically like health, like nurses, uh, caregivers, the IBW, um, electricians, and all of us coming together at the table to push for um, resilient uh, um, community centers. And through that, both in the infrastructure, like these buildings need to be prepared for like power outages or heat or extreme cold or smoke. Um, and then on the flip side, making sure that there's programming and green jobs for union jobs um, and a place for like our elders and our houseless um, and our youth to go and feel safe and cared for and welcomed. Um, and so that is what we are in the midst of working and we're uh, just like super excited by how many like friends we've made and that's been like the biggest goal and like learn 
joyous thing that we've done and a lot of our work is just like wow look at all the friends we made and like thinking of them as friends um and yeah go for it well I wanted to ask you um can you give us some examples of how you've been like rebuilding this direction like what are some of the different events you've been doing to uh to build out that community yeah so a lot of that what we started with um, and I foolishly forgot to mention what the campaign even was. Um, we call it our Healthy Through Heat and Smoke. Um, and the way that campaign got started is we started with a book club. Um, we found a book, we made it free for everybody and accessible uh, in a variety of ways. Like, hey, if you're not a big reader, here's this podcast you can listen to. Oh, you don't have time for that? Here's this little fact sheet that you can read. And we invited everybody into our community space at different points of time um, to just gather and to discuss this one particular book. Um, we also created spaces, like if people weren't ready for that, we created more community building spaces like art builds, um, coming together to create art for this campaign. We also created spaces for people who are like, I'm not there yet, I need some time to process. Um, so we have what we call our um, climate grief and empowerment group where they come together to walk talk through kind of like some of the things that we were talking before about feeling numb and like like some people need to work through that first um, and so we offered space to do that um, in a group setting um, guided by mediators in our community um and then another thing once you, we what, what was the book <laughs> The book. Oh, um, <laughs> that is a good question. And the name of the book is escaping me right now. And I will find it after. Cool. Um, but uh, it was, oh, I can't believe I cannot remember the book. It was a powerful I'll book, never to be forgotten. <laughs> Got it. Yes. Um, and I, it, it was a new thing for us. So like, that's how we started a campaign instead of this like massive call to action or like a uh, last minute thing that popped up in an email. It was just like, hey, what if we all got together and talked about a book together? And then in conversation, we built a campaign. We learned what different people from the different parts of our community wanted and needed. Um, and we did our research and we mapped our community and mapped out who, uh, who we would need to get on our side. We definitely took some uh, inspiration from the labor movement of just being like, all right, who are the stakeholders um, and who do we need to have conversations with? Um, and it's been a really great learning in like bringing in different elements from other movements outside of the climate movement um, and pairing it with our own. Cause like another lesson that we learned coming out of the pandemic sometimes you just need to work a little just work smarter and not harder like there's no need to recreate the wheel over and over and over again we don't need 50,000 more documents <laughs> brainstorming someone there's somewhere somewhere someone somewhere has already done some of this work and all we have to do is have a conversation with them um and to like get inspiration from how other people are doing their uh engagement and actions in the world and to um to replicate that work. Um, yeah. Great. Um, Shimona, one more question about sort of just how you've been organizing. So a lot of what you've done has been shifting from, uh, this is a, a very global North way of organizing by drive, driving campaigns through set a target, set a goal, action, action, action. And that now you've been shifting uh, into a, a different way of, of operating and that one that seems very replicable for other groups. Um, are there other techniques that you've been grabbing or using uh, that you think would be useful for other people if they were to begin working in this kind of way uh, that would be helpful for them to, as you're, I mean, this is an experiment, right? You're yeah. doing an experiment. So are there other techniques that you would suggest for people based on your experiment that you've learned as you are working with activists who are working at 100 miles per hour, kilometers, sorry, global, 100 kilometers per hour, 
uh, 120, 150 kilometers per hour to <laughs> going at a, a different speed. So just curious, other, other lesson that you would grab out of this? I think our biggest lesson was when we had to go to a certain point of where we had to give ourselves the permission to slow down, even stop and do a lot of the internal work. So for us, a lot of the challenges and to even get to that experimenting mode was to like, honestly, learn how to set boundaries, learn how to say no to things, acknowledge that like, whoa, the scope of what we were doing was too much for us and we had to focus. Um, having a lot more conversation about mental health and asking for the things that we needed and being there for each other when, like Bill said, like one of us needed to step back, there was other people who could fill that spot space. Um, and in the past, like that was not something we were good at. And this is the year that we got really good at holding each other, naming the things that we needed um, and being, uh, setting that up for our volunteers and our partners as well as like being, transparent about like here's where we're at and here's what we can do um and also just like adding that on every level even in our documents of just like mental health reminders you don't have to you are allowed to say no if you need space take space like being honest about like our own personal needs and boundaries and um and navigating that as like on the personal level, as a small team, as an organization. And so those that was a lot of uh, things that we took time to do. We did a lot of training around um, trauma-informed conflict resolution, because like, let's be real, this is a really traumatic time that we're going, to, going through. And sometimes things happen and conflict arises and we need to find the tools to deal with it in a healthy way. And not in a way that says conflict is bad, like, no, it's good as long as we can work through it and meet each other on either side and like find ways to move past it, learn from it and keep growing. Um, and we did a lot of that <laughs> throughout the pandemic. Um, I'm not ashamed to admit it. It's how, we, it's how we keep moving through this. Like, let's be real. We, sometimes we fight and we got to find a way to make sure that we're not fighting each other, but we're fighting with each other. Um, and it's okay to struggle together. Um, and so that was a lot of the, the big lessons that we learned um, in this past year. And like, uh, I'm really proud about how transparent we are about like asking and re um, receiving feedback. That is another thing that, especially in the, you know, the global North is, and the USA, like admitting like we made a mistake is like really hard. <laughs> um, and, and doing the repair work necessary after if a mistake is made is like also can be really hard, but like I, we're, we're making really great progress on like doing that well and like getting to a point where like, yeah, we might make a mistake, but we know how to, we know how to apologize and repair. So instead of being like, we're perfect, we never make mistakes. Um, that's not true. <laughs> Um, thank you for all of that. That I, I just appreciate that trajectory. And in some ways, one thing I'm hearing is uh, Yeb said, it's not a battleground. And I hear you offering another image of, I, I see you almost as a, like a, a fern, the way that ferns grow and kind of release up as a gentle tendril. Yeah. And so the image, I mean, use the word growth. That's what tripped that into me. But the idea that what we're doing is we're we're growing the movement, and that's a gentle act as opposed to a battlefield that we're in, in you know on. Um, thank you. That's that's wonderful. Um, and uh, and we're excited to see where three hundred and fifty Seattle goes next. Um, and so, Oscar, uh, I want to bring you into this conversation to share about the work that you've been doing. Uh, you've been working on fracking in Colombia, which has had um, a, some some successes and then setbacks. And uh, and you're hearing this conversation about how we're also dancing with the state of the movement. So both bring us into the situation in Colombia and the work that you've been doing. And also, what are some of the lessons that you're bringing to us about the, the inspiration about how to organize in these times? Because your context is different and, uh, and you've also been making huge strides and huge progress. And so it's been fun 
you don't know it, but I've been watching you from afar for a while. So it's great to get to uh, hear close up. Eh, bueno, eh, muy buenas oh, noches acá en Colombia. Este... Sorry, I, I made a mistake to Shimona's point. Uh, just in case uh, folks have not uh, gone and checked interpretation, Oscar will be speaking in Spanish. So if you haven't checked uh, English as your language of choice, uh, you'll want to do that so that you can hear Oscar. I made a mistake. It's okay. Thank you, Oscar. Okay, no, de nada, Daniel. Eh, pues no, muchas gracias a todas y todos eh, por este espacio a, a 350. Para mí también es un honor poder compartir la palabra en este, en esta reunión, en este espacio. No, pues eh, Oscar Zampayo es defensor de derechos humanos y de la naturaleza aquí en Colombia, un país de Sudamérica de 50 millones de habitantes. Eh, con, que limita con Venezuela, con Brasil, con Ecuador, con Perú eh, y con Panamá. Eh, nosotros, eh, desde las organizaciones eh, sociales que estamos en este territorio, que es el Magdalena Medio, a la orilla del río Magdalena, en un puerto a la orilla del río Magdalena que se llama Barranca Bermeja, eh, hacemos parte de una pequeña eh, organización, una organización local que se llama la Corporación Regional Yariguí de Jean, que eh, defendemos la naturaleza de estas dinámicas de extracción de hidrocarburos que se ha impuesto sobre el territorio por más de 104 años que lleva esta dinámica acá en, en, en Barranca Bermeja. Nosotros eh, estamos desde esa, desde esa organización local eh, haciendo incidencia regional y nacional y articulamos bueno eh, me, 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 me mutearon pero bueno eh, una, una plataforma eh, se llama la Alianza Colombia Libre de Fracking que es un, 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 una plataforma que la integra más de 100 organizaciones de diferentes partes de Colombia, eh, de la región del Magdalena Medio, eh, de Bucaramanga, del departamento de Santander y de, y de, y de, pues otra, de otras ciudades de, de Colombia. Eh, nosotros, lamentablemente, eh, en Colombia vivimos en una situación de violencia exacerbada, es eh, muy alta en la cual los líderes ambientales estamos sufriendo y padeciendo de diferentes agresiones a la vida. Global Witness en el reporte del 2020 reportó alrededor de 65 asesinatos a líderes ambientales y en medio de esta situación él es la que nosotros tenemos que vivir o lo que tenemos que padecer. La violencia en este país está recrudeciendo eh, hacia diferentes liderazgos eh, sociales, los líderes defensores eh, de derechos humanos o firmantes de paz. Acordémonos que Colombia sale de un proceso o, o de una guerra eh, con una guerrilla que duró más de 50 años y desde el 2016 se firma un tratado de paz entre el Estado colombiano y estas guerrillas y a partir de, del 2016 se han asesinado a cientos de eh, de firmantes de, de ese proceso de paz. En medio de eso también han, han asesinado a líderes sociales y entre ellos a líderes ambientales. Entonces la labor que nosotros eh, ejercemos es muy dramática y es muy eh, preocupante. Eh, los compañeros han tenido que salir exiliados a diferentes partes del mundo. Eh, hay hoy un compañero en Estados Unidos de, de la Corporación Regional Cariguís y de la Alianza Colombia Libre de Fracking exiliados desde el 2019. Otra compañera, Yuelis, que se encuentra en Francia exiliada por esa dramática situación en la que viven los defensores de la naturaleza o los eh, líderes ambientales en Colombia, donde se asesina, se violenta, se maltrata, se, se, se estigmatiza, se criminaliza a las personas que defienden la naturaleza. Eh, en medio de esta situación, en medio de esta violencia, las comunidades indígenas eh, han padecido de una situación bien lamentable. 
son estas, estos liderazgos, los eh, líderes indígenas ambientales, los que más han sido asesinados en Colombia en el último año. Eh, hay al, eh, en este momento, en, a septiembre del 2022, se pueden sumar más de 17 asesinatos de líderes indígenas en diferentes regiones del país, principalmente en el departamento del Cauca. Una situación dramática que se está viviendo en Colombia con el asesinato de estos liderazgos indígenas. Eh, en medio de esta situación tan violenta, tan dramática, eh, nosotros desde la Alianza Colombia Libre de Fracking hemos realizado unas acciones de incidencia eh, de todo tipo, eh, social, política, jurídica, y hemos logrado eh, impedir que la técnica del fracturamiento hidráulico, la técnica del fracking, se pueda desarrollar en Colombia. Eh, los principales interesados en realizar esta técnica en Colombia son una empresa estadounidense, la ExxonMobil, e igualmente empresas canadienses, eh, y eh, la empresa Ecopetrol de, de, de aquí de, 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 de Colombia. Eh, nosotros, eh, en medio de, este, de esta situación de, de, de incidencia social, política y jurídica, hemos logrado eh, hacer diferentes acciones eh, constitucionales, administrativas, eh, para lograr que esta técnica se, no se ejecute o no se eh, eh, realice eh, aquí en Colombia y también nos ha generado amenazas. En este mes se han realizado o hemos vivido o hemos padecido más de 20 amenazas eh, y de atentados contra compañeros que hacen parte de la Alianza Colombia Libre de Fracking por oponerse a la técnica del fracturamiento hidráulico y allí es donde exigimos y llamamos al respeto por los derechos humanos eh, y eh, a la debida diligencia a, eh, por parte de estas empresas y por parte también del Estado colombiano para que se evite violentar y generar vulneraciones a los derechos humanos de los activistas y de los líderes que nos oponemos al fracking. Eh, en medio de, este, de, de esta incidencia y este, de, de estos riesgos eh, ha sido victorioso nuestro ejercicio debido a que pues a hoy hemos logrado detener este, este, esta, esta imposición de esta técnica. Eh, tenemos eh, allí unas, eh, eh, una incidencia muy política, eh, compañeros, Daniel, eh, eh, este, Shemona, eh, y es que hemos logrado por lo menos construir documentos o, o proyectos de ley eh, para intentar prohibir esta técnica y creemos que en este, en, este, en este año o muy próximamente, gracias a la incidencia de muchos actores, principalmente de la Alianza Colombia Libre de Fracking, vamos a lograr este, establecer, eh, eh, detener eh, o, o prohibir mediante una norma la, 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 la prohibición de la técnica del fracking y el desarrollo de los yacimientos no convencionales. Entonces, eh, pues sí, creemos que estamos haciendo una incidencia también social, Daniel, en la movilización de cientos y de miles de colombianos en diferentes escenarios a partir de unas pedagogías. Y, y bueno, eh, es que, lo dejaría hasta allí. I'm just pausing you so the interpreters can catch up. Uh, and um, one thing that's interesting about your context is that uh, unlike Yeb or Svetlana, uh, whose political context has just rapidly deteriorated, Colombia has threads of hope uh, in its political context. And many of that are pieces that you've earned as a movement. And can you speak about what are some of the, the things that you've done that's helped earn that context? Uh, uh, a very strong vice president who has deep credentials as a climate activist, uh, shaping the, the legislation you're talking about. Um, and even in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of uh, a long war, what are some of those elements that you all have been able to maintain uh, to be successful? Um, and yeah. Bueno, Daniel, vivimos un escenario político diferente a partir de, 
la elección de Gustavo Petro y de Francia Márquez como eh, eh, siendo electos como presidente. Eh, pero también hay una esperanza grande en que las mayorías en, en lo legislativo, en el Congreso de la República, se puedan mantener para generar esas transformaciones. Eh, por eso es que la incidencia política se ha logrado eh, y ha llevado a que figuras más allá de Francia y más allá de Gustavo terminen en una posición dentro del Congreso, que es donde se generan eh, eh, los de, los principales debates para la transformación de un país. Eh, el escenario es positivo, el escenario hoy creemos que es algo esperanzador, eh, pero tenemos esta preocupación en torno a otros factores geopolíticos que están alterando pues, las eh, principales eh, sí, propuestas de gobierno eh, o, de, o de, sí, de, de, de gobierno que ojalá se, se, se establezcan las principales propuestas de campaña que se establezcan en el gobierno y es en torno a, lo, a los temas extractivos eh, debido a estas situaciones geopolíticas eh, hoy Colombia que estaba llamado a, a transitar a, a, hacia el camino de la transición energética justa hacia las comunidades con estas propuestas de Francia y con estas propuestas de, de, de Gustavo Petro, pues hoy nos dicen, pero venga, eh, es que necesitamos el carbón que hay en su país o el carbón que existe en, en esos países porque el, 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 el carbón de Rusia no se puede comprar. Entonces nos someten a unas, a unas lógicas que pues entendemos, pero también generan unos riesgos sobre los caminos de, hacia la transición energética justa que necesita eh, entrar los países de América Latina o de otros lugares del sur eh, en estos momentos. Entonces, eh, tenemos preocupación al respecto eh, con estos sentidos que otros intereses más, más globales terminen opacando y terminen pues, imponiéndose eh, a unas políticas eh, de gobierno que se pretenden eh, desarrollar eh, para el beneficio de todos los colombianos. Entonces, eh, y otro tema fundamental, Daniel y, y compañeros, es el tema de la protección de la Amazonía. Eh, estamos viendo que la Amazonía colombiana está siendo altamente deforestada eh, y es un tema que tiene que ser eh, pues, eh, de una prioridad para el gobierno, pero también para el mundo, eh, en la preservación de este espacio y este territorio que genera unos bienes ecosistémicos o unos, sí, unos, unas garantías para la preservación de, de, de muchas especies, pero también contribuye a, a que la naturaleza de América del Sur, pero también del planeta, eh, tengan unas calidades que debemos proteger y el tema de la deforestación eh, está siendo muy alta en, esto, en este lugar de, de, de Sudamérica. And so with the campaign that you've been running around fracking, um, what are some of the, as you've been listening to people talking about the state of the movement, what are some of the uh, ways that you've been adapting, how you've been working based on the, the landscape that we're living in right now? Eh, no, Daniel eh, y compañeros, en este momento la, la principal estrategia es detener eh, los pilotos de fracking que dejó autorizado el gobierno anterior. Dejó unos contratos eh, firmados eh, y va a ser complicado para el nuevo gobierno poder eh, generar unas controversias contractuales o poder este, pues, rever revertir estos contratos ya firmados entre el Estado colombiano, eh, pues eh, en, sí, en ese entonces representado por el gobierno Iván Duque y, y empresas como ExxonMobil, empresas como Shell, eh, empresas canadienses como Canacol Energy, bueno, unas empresas junior, eh, petrolera junior, eh, que operan aquí en Colombia con inversión canadiense. Entonces ese es el principal reto de poder revertir y, o poder generar esas controversias contractuales con estos contratos ya firmados. Entonces seguimos eh, con un fuerte 
eh, ejercicio de incidencia política a nivel nacional en el Congreso para que, la, para que se debata el proyecto de ley y se pueda prohibir en medio de un proyecto de ley el desarrollo de la técnica. Mm, igualmente, estamos adelantando una fuerte pedagogía con las comunidades, con unos riesgos, eh, pero los asumimos en temas de seguridad. Eh, estamos acompañando a las comunidades en su territorio, eh, generando pedagogía, generando información, bajando, bueno, eh, eh, traduciendo estos eh, estudios técnicos, estudios científicos que entregan las petroleras para que el ciudadano del común, el pescador, el campesino, eh, el ciudadano eh, del pueblo eh, que vive en estas ruralidades de Colombia que son muy empobrecidas puedan entender estos documentos eh, de los estudios de impacto ambiental para que tengan una comprensión de la magnitud del perjuicio y de las afectaciones a la naturaleza y a las afectaciones al entorno de, lo, de la fauna y de la flora que se puede generar si se permite la explotación por medio del fracking. Entonces, eh, hacemos pedagogía fuerte en estos territorios y hoy tenemos una gran aceptación de las comunidades locales y nacionales. O es decir, hoy no hay un, un licenciamiento social eh, por parte del pueblo colombiano para que este tipo de proyectos se puedan desarrollar y eso es gracias a la pedagogía en diferentes niveles que hemos logrado eh, de este, capacitar o de generar pues, información más allá de lo técnico y de lo que sale en televisión o lo que explican los interesados, principalmente las empresas petroleras. Entonces, eso es lo que hemos hecho, Daniel, y hemos obtenido victorias. Entonces, el llamado es a la organización social a, a, a generar eso que tú decías de la, de la, del tejido social y también de lo que es, es, Levan, es Libana de, manifestaba de generar justicia. Nosotros estamos llamando a hacer justicia ambiental por medio de estos proyectos porque pues, no, no comprendemos en medio de este caos climático, esta irracionalidad eh, en, la, en el consumo que está generando estas, esta crisis climática que Colombia, según eh, las Naciones Unidas, uno, es uno de los principales países en verse afectados en este caos climático y lo estamos viviendo, eh, están pues, profundizando el negocio eh, de la extracción de hidrocarburos utilizando esta técnica del fracking. Entonces, hay unos riesgos, Daniel, pero continuamos allí en la defensa eh, de la naturaleza, eh, pre, también protegiéndonos y, y defendiendo los derechos humanos. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Oscar. Um, one of the things I hear is the, that as this, uh, as the political situation begins to shift, which is what we are seeing in more places, that it will continue to shift, that we then have to deal with a new problem, which is the breaking of deals that have been made by our governments previously, or the, the, the dealing with, uh, Jeff on the chat was talking about earlier, the fact that the language of reserves uh, is not a useful term for fossil fuel that's sitting in the ground. Uh, but that it should be called something like our our burden, because it's now a burden to have fracking underneath us. A, it's a burden to have oil, gas underneath us because it becomes a threat to our community directly and a threat to the planet. And so um, one of the new situations that will unfold in more of our context is how do we break those deals that have been historically made or the promises because they are no longer moral. They never were moral. But the morality is is it cannot be tolerated, and so I appreciate you talking about some of the strategies of community-based direct action and education, the political pressure, uh, and then I'm also aware that for many other places, also we've been using a lot of the financial tools, uh, getting international banks to be the ones to break the break it from the financial perspective. Um, anything else that you just want to add before we're, we're just, we're rounding into the last piece here, but anything else that you want to add, Oscar? 
No, este, Daniel, eh, pues por último, dar de nuevo las gracias eh, y generar este tipo de, de, de espacios, porque aunque sean unas luchas locales eh, y bueno, y, y regionales en Sudamérica, eh, son pues dinámicas que se deben manifestar en diferentes latitudes del mundo, eh, porque son empresas principalmente del norte global que vienen a estos territorios a generar este tipo de tensiones eh, y de conflictos socioambientales eh, y los principales pues, beneficiados, los principales, eh, sí, eh, los que ganan con este negocio principalmente son eco economías o empresas del norte global, pero las afectaciones y las contaminaciones eh, y las violaciones a los derechos humanos las vivimos aquí eh, en el sur global. Entonces ese llamado a, a generar este tipo de sinergias eh, como lo manifestaban, eh, porque son luchas que en este momento se están profundizando en, este, en, este, en esta parte del mundo, porque nos están llamando a profundizar el extractivismo de todo tipo eh, y nos preocupa. Eh, hay planes hasta el 2050 de seguir extrayendo petróleo en nuestros territorios a costa eh, y el despojo de, de nuestras comunidades y el exterminio de pueblos originarios. Entonces, eh, muchas gracias, Daniel, eh, y muchas gracias a todas y todas por, por, por permitirme compartir la palabra. Beautiful. Thank you, Oscar. Um, and I want to thank everyone uh, for attending, those of you who are watching this as a recording, which we're sending out, those of you who are watching it on stream or watching it live on Zoom. Um, thank you, all the participants. Uh, thank you, all of the tech people, the interpreters. Sorry, I speak too fast. Um, thank you for your patience. Thank you for all the panelists. Um, and I just want to say Katie's going to put up um, a link for uh, if you have any feedback or evaluation, or if you do want a certificate for attending this, that's uh, there's ways that you can get that through that link. Um, and I also just want to, um, uh, if you do have any feedback that you want to offer us or additional ideas or connections, um, we will be sending out this recording along with um, some of the chat uh, so that people can watch it on ongoing. Um, Again, thank you, everybody. Uh, I just want to close with a quick story uh, that I think, for me at least, relates to this moment of, of the state of the movement. And so the story is, it's about me and canoeing. So uh, my, my daughter, who's three at the time, she and myself uh, and my sister, Andrea Pada, uh, were, we were all in the canoe together. And so we were canoeing, it was a beautiful day, sunshine, blue skies. And uh, we got out to this small little island near where I live, had some picnic, and we saw a few clouds off in the horizon. And so we said, we should probably get back. And so as we were heading back home, uh, suddenly the this, uh, this storm just came upon us very quickly. And it started raining heavily, it started very large waves, uh, and began to tip our boat. I'm a strong canoer. I've, I've never had an experience where I've ever tipped before, and I tipped. Uh, we all were wearing life jackets, um, but my daughter immediately started screaming. And so I grabbed her immediately, got her right, right into my arms. We grabbed the canoe, and so there we are. And we realized we just have to get to shore. So the best that I can do in these large waves, I'm keeping my daughter above the water in one hand. I've got my paddle that I had held onto in the other hand. With another hand, I'm holding onto the canoe. And with another hand, I'm, I'm swimming towards shore. And so I'm swimming for, I don't know how many minutes it is. And I realize we are not getting a lot closer to shore. And so I look back at Andrea and I see her, she has the same look that I have in my eyes. And it's the look of, I don't know how long this is gonna take. I don't know if we're gonna make it. And this is where the metaphor is about where we are in the movement. We don't have certainty. 
and I look at Andrea and we've known each other for years. And so I know what she's saying to me. She's saying to me, there's nothing else to do but to just keep swimming. And I think of that as so strongly the metaphor for where we are right now. And so it's just the, the, the thing is, is we just have to keep swimming. So there I am, the three of us, me, my daughter, and Andrea, and we just keep swimming. And there's this moment where I'm calculating how long, how long will this continue? I don't know if I can do this for how many hours. And so that fear creeps in. And so I just mark it for those of us who maybe we have a lot of hope, not a lot of hope, but there's still a behavior to do. We still keep swimming to shore because that's the way to get my daughter safe, me and my, my friend, my sister. And so I take a moment at some point where I just, I need to readjust to Shimona's point about just, I just need to be where I am. So I'm like, oh, this arm is too tired. So I readjust, I put my other daughter, I put, put my daughter in my other arm. I, I get the canoe in a, another arm and, and start swimming out with another one. And then I realized in that moment, I can touch the bottom. <laughs> and that is also a part of social movements, which is, I, I've been part of many wins. And mo most of them, there are moments that we absolutely know uh, what's coming next. And then there's big moments where we just don't know. We don't see the wind coming. We don't see the thing that's going to shift or break. We don't see the psychic break that's happening in our country and it breaks open. We don't see a historical moment available and, and suddenly things shift. And we're not guaranteed them, but they also happen. And they happen even though we've done the best analysis we can do, the most robust analysis about what's politically feasible. And I could touch the shore. Andrea couldn't because she's shorter than I am, uh, and but I could touch the bottom. And so I began walking us towards the shore. And so me, Andrea, my daughter, Avery, we all made it to the shore safely. And so we were none the worse for wear. We, we made it through and, and on, I hope someday that we get to all hang out together and you can hear Avery tell her side of the story as she tells her version of going into the canoe and coming out and, and getting to the shore. But I share it because I think this is a moment for us uh, just to remember about what's possible, uh, about what hope is, and also just to keep encouraging each other to just keep swimming. Svetlana, Bill, Yeb, Oscar, Sh Shimona, we just keep swimming. And so wherever you are, I just wanna encourage that. More power to you, more strength, more love, uh, I love all the work that we're doing. I love this movement. I love the people in it. And I'm just really grateful for all of you. So with that, thank you so much. I will post the evaluation at the end, but thank you so much, everyone. Blessings. <laughs>